Welcome everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for joining to the um, webinar on the bio-based coatings and food contact materials organized by uh, Preserve, our project. Uh, I hope you will enjoy it. Um, let me just start by introducing myself. My name is uh, Aldo Reyes. I work for Iris Technology Solution. We are a company based in Barcelona and we have the pleasure to coordinate this uh, very nice project, Preserve, uh, in collaboration with uh, 27 more companies and uh, research entities across Europe. A few of them will speak today and will um, give us uh, a brief summary of um, what results and what challenges we have on the bio-based coatings and food contact materials. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, please let me first um, provide a few points of information, first of all. I will kindly ask you to try to keep your microphones on mute during the presentation so we do not disturb the speakers while they speak. Uh, also, please feel free to submit any written questions on the chat via Zoom. They will uh, be try to be answered by the end of the session where we will have uh, a short Q&A uh, session. And also please note that this uh, webinar is being recorded. The event is being recorded, so it will be later available on the Preserve project website for your consultation. Okay, so with no further delay, please let me <clears throat> introduce you to uh, Christina Heisenberger. She is our technical coordinator in Preserve, and she will provide us with a uh, brief introduction of the project. Christina um, is a research group leader at the Sustainable Packaging Institute at the Alstad Sigmaringen University. She holds a PhD in microbiology and she's actively participating in other projects uh, of the multinational uh, research impact. Please, Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aldo, for this nice introduction. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to have you here. Thank you for taking the time to join this webinar. I will shortly present um, the Preserve project, um, which is also called High Performance Sustainable Bio-Based Packaging with Tailored End of Life and Upcycle Secondary Use. So let's start with some of the main figures. So it's a four-year project, which started in Jan 2021 and will accordingly end in December uh, 2024. It is funded by the um, Horizon 2020 program of the European Commission under the topic of upcycling bioplastics uh, of food and drink packaging. Uh, by now we have 23 partners, including seven uh, research organizations, but also partners along the circular supply and value chain, um, which includes large end users uh, and also the largest bioplastics producer users association. Um, so as you can see here, um, and the scheme, we really have uh, several industrial partners uh, regarding raw material, plastic, packet, plastic and packaging converter, and users, and also on the side of up and recyclers. Why do we need preserve? Um, as of now, Europe is far from its target in terms of CO2 footprint neutrality, which should be reached by 2050. Also in terms of circular economy, we are far from the target um, regarding circular economy. Uh, it, all plastic packaging should be recyclable by uh, 2030. Therefore, we need high performance bio-based materials. Um, what I mean with high performance bio-based materials. So except for drop-in solutions, um, bio-based materials often do not have the same performance as fossil-based um, polymers and plastic, uh, which means we need a toolbox to upgrade them and to really enhance them so um, they can efficiently contribute to circular economy. And of course, circular economy also means that the upcycling or recycling approaches need to be better established and in motion. Also, biodegradability of biopolymers is uh, at the moment rather restricted to um, certain environments and also um, expanding these um, can help to reduce um, plastic waste or uh, also the CO2 footprint. So, okay, so let's come to the preserve objective. So I will explain about this scheme. 
So um, let's start by um, new biopolymer synthesis. From starting from here, um, packaging can be produced. And um, after a certain lifespan, it will go um, into the end of life toolbox. What we do in preserve with the biopolymers, it will, they will enter these upgrading and upcycling toolbox. Here we have um, protein barrier coatings and adhesives, PHA coatings, electron uh, radiation treatment, and also enzymation. This toolbox uh, will be used to produce packaging, bio-based packaging, and also at this end of life, it will go into the end of life uh, toolbox where we have several approaches. One is, for instance, biodegradation, which means that um, certain polymers that are biodegradable will return, so to say, into biomass, which can then be used for new biopolymer synthesis. When we, but this is not real uh, material recovery. So when we think about material recovery, we have, for instance, enzymatic recycling, which means that a certain polymer is degraded into its oligomers, which then can again feed into the new uh, biopolymer synthesis, which then of course can re-enter um, our upgrading uh, toolbox. The other approaches regarding material recovery are delamination for recycling, which means that multi-layer structures are separated in their um, in the polymers that could consist of in the different layers and also reinforcement of bicomponent uh, polymers. And these two here uh, uh, will lead us uh, to recycled biopolymers, which then again can enter our upgrading toolbox. And from this on, we can produce textiles, personal care packaging and composites. So the technical activities to reach our pre solved solutions are, um, as I said, we apply protein-based um, barrier coatings, PHA coating, radiation treatment, um, and then we use these recycled biopolymers for personal uh, care and transport packaging. So basically we, we use all these, all our toolboxes um, to produce food and drink packaging, like, like beverage brick and flow packs and trays and so on. And after the end of life, they are recycled with our um, preserve solutions. And then again, we can use these materials for um, secondary raw materials that are then upcycled into personal care packaging, but also textiles and composites. So with this, I'm at the end of this very brief introduction. Um, if you have any questions also later, please feel free to, to reach out to us. So thank you for your um, time and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Christina, for this very nice introduction of the of the project. I hope um, it was clear for everyone. As Christina mentions, if you have any questions, please post them in the in the chat, and we will have um, a look at the end of the session. Well, um, then our next speaker uh, is um, Kais Kais Jurgen. Uh, he will introduce us the Crowdelix platform for the circular plastic helix for the impact acceleration and the future collaboration. Uh, one of the key tools that we have and we use actively use in the project. Guys is responsible for, responsible for growing the, the academic and industrial membership based of the Crowdelix uh, international network and collaboration platform. He will introduce the circular plastic community that drives the, this impact for uh, future collaborations in the preserve uh, research results. Guys, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. All right, so uh, thank you very much. So I have about 10 minutes to, to introduce this to you. So I'm Case Jurgens. I am the head of membership development at Crowd Helix, based in London in the UK. And I'm going to give you an overview of the circular plastic Helix community on our virtual collaboration platform and maybe a couple of other communities that might be worth seeing so you can see how uh, our platform functions and helps to uh, boost the impact acceleration of the preserve project. Uh, for those of you who are already members of Crowd Helix, you can come to crowdhelix.com register 
and you will find your organization in the drop down menu here. Uh, if you're not a member of Crowd Helix, you can still sign in in a limited way. Uh, just type in the name of the project and you will be able to access the platform with a limited personal profile to take a look at what we're doing, the collaborative partnerships we're facilitating, and also results coming out of the project. So a little bit of background uh, before I dive right in. CrowdHelix is uh, an international network and virtual collaboration platform. Our main focuses are facilitating collaborative partnerships between academia and industry to do open innovation projects, for example, under Horizon Europe. Uh, the other uh, focus and purpose of our platform is to disseminate results coming out of the projects we're involved in. Uh, opportunities refers to the number of posts on our platform, usually from researchers who are offering or seeking expertise of some kind. Uh, collaborators are our users, our members are universities, research centers, SMEs, NGOs, policymakers, charities, multinationals, basically anyone participating in the European research area. And we have members based in 58 countries. These are the most recent opportunities posted across all areas of interest where we're facilitating collaborative partnerships. But today we're focusing on the Preserve Project Helix community. A Helix is basically an ecosystem which is populated with stakeholders that are focused on building collaborative partnerships, doing open innovation, or taking part in a project's results. So uh, IP generation, market uptake, financing, uh, clustering, future partnerships for sister projects. These are all of the types of opportunities you will find within our Helix communities, where organizations and individuals profile themselves, their expertise, and how they can work together. Obviously not everyone in the world is focused on all of the same areas of interest. So for this reason, we can filter by communities more relevant to us. In this case, circular plastics. The platform is also recommending maybe circular industry or maybe materials, for example. These are three of the 47 communities on the CrowdHelix platform. Now we're seeing the most recent opportunities posted across the, uh, the areas that we've filtered by and we can take a deep dive into a couple of these posts as we see fit. Uh, so here's one from the University of Bologna based in Italy, just an example. This is a post targeting um, an upcoming Horizon Europe deadline of the 20th of September. Eleonora has posted in the circular plastics and circular industry communities. This means every single person across those two communities has been automatically notified that there is an opportunity to collaborate here. In this case, they're leading a work package, but they're seeking expertise in uh, these specific areas, forest-based value chains, for example. Uh, and these are keywords that we could search across the whole platform. Every post, every organization with this expertise, every department, laboratory, uh, individual person, or even exploitable results coming out of projects. Uh, you would have the opportunity to either leave a comment below. You could share this opportunity to collaborate with a colleague of yours or you could send Eleonora a direct private message. This is a pretty standard way in which we look to facilitate collaborative partnerships in specific areas of interest. Uh, let's take a closer look at one more post very quickly. Um, for example, this post coming here, uh, this is another type of member. In this case, it's coming from a large multinational corporation, Cargill. Many of you may have heard of them. Uh, they've posted in the circular industry and energy helix communities, and in the same way, they are looking to build collaborative partnerships for a research and innovation action with a far off deadline, and they're getting lots of good engagement across our platform. So if you're interested in collaborating in this way, then please do reach out to us. Let's take a closer look at the specific communities that we're really focusing on today. Under Helixes, you can check out every single community. You don't even need to be signed into CrowdHelix to do this. The Preserve Projects community is Circular Plastics. If we click on it, here we can see the most recent opportunities for collaboration that have been posted. Uh, we can also see results coming out of the project with varying TRL levels. This is the other reason for CrowdHelix existing. So if we wanted to, we could go in, take a closer look. Uh, this has been added by AIMPLAS, a leading organization in this area on CrowdHelix. 
uh, this um, coding formulations to improve water resistance result coming from these projects. It from preserve specifically, it has a TRL level of four. This is how we're trying to get the project's results in front of the eyeballs of potential stakeholders. And this is working uh, very well. This is a fairly new feature on Crowd Helix, but you'll see it's already had quite a lot of activity. So if you have a circular plastics, circular economy focused project result that you would like to disseminate, this would be the place to do it. We can take a quicker look, a uh, closer look at the Helix itself as well. This is a Helix page. Every single Helix has a page like this. We can take a closer look at the background, the scope. Why was this community created? Uh, in this case, the multi-cycle project was funded under Horizon 2020 and created initially this community. And then this community did its job very well. It bred a second project in the area of circular plastics preserve the, the, the project we're focusing on today. Um, we have mapped over 600 researchers from 200 plus organizations based in 42 countries onto this Helix community. This is the reach of the results and the posts that you're adding to the Circular Plastics Helix. These are the number of people who are going to see it and potentially engage with your opportunity to collaborate or your key exploitable result. Uh, my colleague Bianca is the manager of this community. Aimplast is the leading organization. Every single Helix has a leading organization, maybe to ensure engagement within the community, uh, maybe to help organize or host events, things like that. And then we have the major players as well from both within the consortium and beyond who have decided that they want to feature their logo here within the community because they're very keen to collaborate. They want you to reach out to them to discuss ways in which you could work together to deliver open innovation projects. And then of course, another way we disseminate and communicate the, uh, the results of projects is through events like the one that we're hosting right now. So this is another feature of this impact model, so to speak, that we have implemented in over 30 proposals that have been funded. Uh, maybe it's worth taking a look at um, one more community, just for example, a linked community circular industry. Almost all of the communities on our platform are cross-cutting in some way. So you can come and check out the circular industry Helix as well, if you wanted to. And it may have some opportunities to collaborate that would be relevant to you. Um, I will wrap up very shortly, but just so that you know, organizations on CrowdHelix, they are welcome to profile themselves. Organizations at the top create a profile for themselves, indicating how and why their organization would like to collaborate, participate in open innovation projects. They can profile their departments, their faculties, their laboratories as well. And then individual people also profile themselves within the CrowdHelix platform. So this is a great way for your organization and your researchers to really raise their visibility, become involved in more open innovation projects, decide to which communities you would like to subscribe to um, receive notifications about activity and collaboration happening in areas of interest uh, to you. And then finally, uh, what we'd like to do if you're interested in, in circular plastics is you know, bring you into this community, start uh, helping you engage with the results, engage in future collaborative opportunities as well. And at the end of the year, what we're really keen to do is to have facilitated collaborative partnerships for you, for your organization that have led to funding. We tend to quantify this through the number of funding received by member organizations on our platform, as well as case studies that we put together after they have either successfully submitted proposals or evaluation results have come out and they have received funding. This is the entire point of Crowd Helix. So you, anybody is welcome to come and check out these pages uh, as they see fit. The only uh, page that will you know, not be quite as open to you is opportunities, but you, you can see these communities if you sign in through, um, through the preserve uh, portal. And I'll show you that one more time. If you'd like to engage with the preserve project or any other things happening on CrowdHelix, then come to crowdhelix.com slash register. Type and preserve circular plastics helix community, and you will be able to access the platform in a limited way, even if you are not a member. And then we can have a discussion about adding your expertise to this community and uh, helping you engage with the project. 
Um, there's a lot more to Crowd Helix than just this, so please do get in touch with us if you'd like to learn more about it. But the focus today, as I said, is the Preserve project and the Circular Plastics Helix. So we, we really want your engagement. We want your posts. We want your engagement with the results coming out of this excellent project as well, so we can build new projects going forward. So I will relinqu relinquish uh, there. That's my very quick whistle stop tour of Crowd Helix and the Circular Plastics Helix. I look forward to any questions that you have, if you have them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Case, for your for your introduction to the Crowd Helix platform. As I said, in preserve, it's a very very powerful tool that we have uh, in order to engage people in order to to create collaboration and of course to spread the, the knowledge that we are producing in the project. Thank you very much. Uh, for everyone in the audience, please remember that you can place your um, questions or comments in the chat. We are constantly looking at them. Uh, then please let me introduce you our next speaker. Uh, he is Daniele Spinelli from Next Technology Technosile. Um, Daniele holds a PhD in chemical science and he's a valuable member of uh, NTT of the uh, Next Technology Technosiles Research Unit. Uh, with expertise in sustainable textiles and circular economy, he supports the companies in improving competitiveness through environmental evaluations of uh, industrial value chains. And uh, Daniele will speak today about the customer perception of bio-based packaging products and upcycling options. Daniele, whenever you want. So, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, so, today I will give to you um, just a general overview of um, a social perspective about the use of bio based uh, materials, uh, mainly focusing on uh, packaging products and evaluation of uh, some upcycling options. So uh, first of all, uh, when we are going uh, to evaluate uh, the social perspective, uh, uh, we could have a focus on a significant questions. So uh, the first question that usually uh, count also for social impact evaluation is related to why we are using uh, bio-based plastics in our uh, everyday life products. So, uh, mainly, uh, there are different uh, points that should be addressed. So, first of all, uh, that the use of bio-based plastics uh, uh, could reduce the dependency on uh, fossil-based resources. Because, as you know, uh, starting from conventional plastics uh, mean start from um, uh, fossil-based resources that are, are uh, or sure uh, using uh, uh, a lot of energy demands and uh, that are also affecting uh, the world's population. So take into account uh, different alternative or sure uh, the use of bio-based plastics uh, should go in the direction to use and to switch onto renewable resources. That means that uh, this could be important also to reduce uh, the global demand of uh, oil consumption and also uh, reducing the, the impact uh, on the uh, energy requirements for conventional pl plastic production. For sure, uh, the use of renewable resources is a key aspect because uh, unlike also conventional plastic, bio-based plastics are coming from renewable sources. And these sources or sure could come from uh, agricultural uh, wastes or uh, some agricultural fields, so like uh, corn, cereals, or other uh, perennial cultures that are opening at the moment uh, new opportunities for the market. Another important point is that uh, the reduction of greenhouse gases emission uh, is still uh, important uh, in order uh, to to have a new uh, starting point for the production of bio-based plastics. It means that for sure we are approaching to use uh, different feedstock that temporarily are acting as carbon dioxide sequestration effects from atmosphere. So it means that also uh, using our bio-based sources and also uh, take into account the possibility to recycle or upcycle uh, uh, bio-based material that could be used for plastic application uh, could be also a good and effective uh, 
to reduce the carbon dioxide emission from atmosphere. Uh, another important point that also the use of bio-based plastics uh, uh, could create also renewable energy, mainly uh, thinking about uh, their end of life scenarios uh, when recycling or sure is not longer possible. We can also assure a benefit again for the environment because bio-based packaging uh, contains also available energy that can be recovered, uh, mixing in a, a specific power and heat plant to recover energy. And thus sure we could have um, uh, a positive effect uh, comparing uh, to uh, the original effect to removal uh, carbon dioxide from atmosphere. Another important point is also uh, the increasing of resource efficiency uh, because uh, some of bio-based uh, polymers and plastics uh, such as uh, bio-based PE or bio-based PET can also uh, carry it potentially to close the loop and increase uh, the resource efficiency. Uh, so it means uh, uh, that we should produce uh, material for the future, uh, taking into account also their, uh, the resources and for, that are used to obtain the bio-based products, but also the recycling for several times. Because of sure, uh, incineration in order to recover energy should be considered just as a, the last option to be evaluated. And this is because also in a, in a um, preserve project, we are taking into account uh, uh, upcycling routes because it means to transform the material at the end of life in high value products, again, available uh, for the market. So giving uh, an overview of uh, plastics and the plastics that are used at the moment in packaging and the market trends, uh, we can see that uh, there are uh, different options like uh, BioPT or PLA or Bio uh, HDPE or BioPP. So there are different uh, alternative materials uh, that have uh, uh, quite good properties also compared to uh, conventional materials. And in terms of type of application, uh, these materials have shared um, really good uh, properties also for bartles, for bricks, or for caps. Uh, so for different, uh, um, for liquid, I can say, and uh, solid uh, food packaging. So there are now uh, different options that are uh, approaching the new market. Uh, and this is because it's important to understand and uh, to evaluate uh, the social perspective uh, for this new alternative on the market. So um, start using uh, bio-based plastics means uh, a transition for, from uh, uh, a fossil-based economy to a bio-based one. It means uh, uh, that sure the bio-based bio plastics should have uh, a potential to reduce the environmental impact, uh, mainly also uh, starting from uh, their production till uh, their conversion and production and the final disposal. It means uh, uh, that we should evaluate all the environmental uh, performances of the new uh, bio-based uh, uh, plastics. Uh, and also the sustainability of feedstock is uh, uh, really uh, an important uh, point that should be addressed and during uh, the monitoring of the impact of the new, the new use of bio-based plastics, because uh, uh, many of the feedstocks are related to agricultural practices. So it means that we should have a more sustainable and good agricultural practices uh, in order to have a feedstock that could be, for example, cultivated in an uh, uh, area in which agriculture uh, uh, application are not so good. So it means that also the cultivation of, of a feedstock could restore some services for the environment. But to sure, agriculture should have a, a, a less impact on the environment, meaning, for example, to have a very good soil management uh, and good practices, for example, to use fertilizer and pesticides or avoiding as much as possible deforestation and loss of uh, biodiversity. So it means that um, we should in the near future also optimize the conversion efficiency 
of current feedstock and to find alternative, mainly sure avoiding uh, competition with non-food plant crops. But to sure there are different uh, agro wastes that could be used uh, as raw material for biobased plastics. So another important point, uh, uh, as mentioned before, is that uh, at European level, we are moving uh, to um, a cascading use of resources and specifically in biomass in order uh, to have uh, as much as possible biorefinery approach uh, uh, to produce not only uh, new sources uh, for energies, for fueling cars like for bioethanol, biodiesel, but also to recover a, a suitable raw material uh, to develop uh, additive uh, for plastics uh, or to develop a new coating uh, solution uh, for packaging application. So it means uh, that uh, we should find a way to convert uh, all the potentiality on the renewable sources to be transformed into a material and uh, sure closing uh, a loop. So according to that, uh, uh, there are uh, at the moment uh, a lot of some confusion or uh, different expectation that uh, are important to be covered also to find the gap uh, on the use of uh, uh, biobased plastics because uh, Oshua, at the moment there are still not enough uh, information uh, that are also limiting uh, the decision making. Uh, uh, there is also a lack of confidence, uh, thinking of if this material can fit or not, uh, what are the market uh, requirements. So it means uh, uh, that we should uh, find a way to communicate uh, the sustainability uh, of the feedstock that are using at the moment uh, for the conversion in bio-based uh, plastic. And sure, from the uh, industry perspective, uh, there are still some technical requirements that uh, need to be uh, upgraded in order to match the conventional uh, bioplastics. Uh, and so uh, for the company, I, we can say that there is really a challenge because uh, uh, now people and consumers are asking from uh, green products so it means uh, uh, that uh, end user is also um, asking for new solution from the market. But the consumer should have also a clear overview and a clear traceability on the material, uh, because also, as I said before, the possibility to use a renewable feed so is quite good, but should fit also uh, all the aspects of sustainability. And in any case, uh, uh, consumers are more oriented to products that could be recycled at the end of life or to be transformed in a new upcycling solution for the market. It means that we should also uh, push uh, the responsibility of companies mainly to orient the new products to bio-based plastics but could, that could be at, at the end recycled or upcycled. So according to that, uh, uh, when we are evaluating uh, the social perspective, uh, we are using uh, the social life cycle assessment approach that is uh, in, uh, an evaluation tool uh, to evaluate also the positive and negative effect uh, from the social uh, point of view of the new products, take into account also from the raw material supplier till production and uh, finally uh, recycling approach. It means that a product should be considered as sustainable solution if fit uh, the social, the environmental, and uh, the economic uh, aspect. So, um, because uh, uh, in any case, uh, uh, from the social perspective, uh, we should take into account uh, that we have a different audience. So we have workers, we have consumer, we have local community, we have uh, society actors and value chain actors. It means that uh, the role of a social LCA that is also to support as decision making uh, should be related to uh, mapping uh, different uh, uh, innovation areas that are involved in uh, packaging for food and also cosmetic. And to sure, uh, gather the potential social benefit for that. So according to that, we are approaching a, a different online survey to collect information from uh, this uh, reported audience. 
Uh, so uh, these questionnaires are um, quite interactive, and so all the people uh, could indicate uh, their uh, perspective, also giving me information like a score or like as a bullet point. So here you can see just an example of a worker's questionnaire for which it's important to have the, the perception of uh, the workers that are involved in industry according to uh, their everyday life. Consumer uh, uh, are also another important uh, category that they should be uh, monitoring mainly uh, to have um, uh, a clear picture of how respect of the real life, uh, the use of these bio-based material could affect uh, uh, end users and also how end users are ready to, uh, to purchase the products that are made using bioplastics and also that are coming from processing of uh, recycling. So from the social perspective, for sure, uh, will be important to ask how people are ready uh, to purchase uh, bio-based uh, plastics and also take into account uh, the final prices and also the composition of plastics, also referring to uh, traceability of the material. For a local community perspective, it will be important also to have a, a good feedback related to how plastic is affecting the whole everyday life. Also, it could be an interesting alternative and also uh, how we could fit uh, the environmental, sustainable and recycling uh, thematics uh, in our everyday life. So also local community should work in, in the direction to stimulate the market to new and sustainable solution. For uh, value chain actors, uh, we are asking uh, some questions mainly related to uh, the perspective to introduce uh, new uh, bio-based materials in their production sites and also to engage how the research could provide option for industry. So it means that also in some cases, uh, companies are expecting solution that could not affect uh, so much their uh, production site at the moment. So usually we are searching bio-based material that are fitting uh, traditional uh, manufacturing process at the moment in order to have uh, uh, not so much deviation in terms of uh, production approaches. So here we have just reported just a picture just to see how uh, we are collecting information from the online survey. So we can see that uh, uh, most uh, of the, we could have some diagrams uh, or like as a score, but just to give you preliminary information, uh, at the moment, uh, from our uh, online survey, we are collecting three main feedback. First of all, uh, that uh, there is an interest in sustainability and also the use of innovative material for the market, but still the cost uh, remain one of the main elements to be taken into account. For sure, uh, there is a lot of interest to have um, a thematic workshop local events, so people need to be informed about uh, uh, what are expecting from the markets and also uh, to have uh, more sustainable and by use of bio-based plastic packaging, uh, considering also all the environmental consequences, but also the recycling routes. And from the industry point of view, uh, at the moment, uh, uh, the use of innovative uh, sustainable material should have some difficulties for production line and also the cost of the, of the raw material uh, need to be uh, decreased in order to have a more competitive material for the market. And for sure, another important point that at the moment uh, limit the penetration of these materials is related to regulation at European and national level. So it means that uh, all the uh, efforts at European level should be dedicated to solve uh, these key problems uh, that are limiting at the moment the market penetration of the bio-based uh, material for packaging. That's all from my side. 
Thank you, Daniela. Thank you very much. Um, now, on based of everything we have just commented, we will um, have a quick um, question booth session uh, of five <clears> or <throat> five questions uh, that will appear now on the screen, uh, and you will have the audience will have to um, to provide the answer as as they as they prefer. The first one you see it now on the on the screen, well, you see all of them on the screen, but the first one says, how do you feel about the use of plastic packaging in the everyday life? Please, if you can mark one of the options, that would be great. On the second place, it says, how would you rate your attention to the choice of a product depending on the packaging it is contained in? Also a rating from zero to 10. In the third place, are you interested in the social benefits derived from the use of innovative sustainable materials for packaging? In the fourth place, to which extent do you believe that an innovative packaging solution based on renewable materials, in this case bioplastics, would be applicable in your production? In fifth place, to what extent do you think it would be feasible to change the materials of your productive sector? And sixth, which are the main obstacles you identify to change the materials of your productive sector? Let's give a few seconds for the people to be able to answer. Okay, thank you everyone for your answers. They have successfully been collected. And we see the answers here on the screen. For the first question, how do you feel about the use of plastics packaging in the everyday life? As we can see, most of the answers go to the very concerned option. This is good. This is one of the main reasons why Preserve exists. <laughs> Thank you. Number two, how would you rate your attention to the choice for a product depending on the packaging it's contained in? Two, three, four. Well, we see here also um, most of the rated questions go to the higher score, which we understand it's um, the people pays attention to the product that's containing plastic. Number third, are you interested in the social benefits derived from the use of innovative sustainable materials for packaging. Most of the answers goes to yes, I'm interested, and I would accept a higher final price for the product using sustainable packaging. Number four, to which extent do you believe that the innovative packaging solution based on renewable materials bioplastics would be applicable in your production? Most of the answers go from the six to the 10 which is high score. Number five, to what extent do you think would be feasible to change the materials of your productive sector? Similarly, we have high scores from six to 10. And number six, which are the main obstacles you identify to change the materials of your productive sector? Where here we have a more split um, division of, of answers, but uh, the most but the one is technical barriers. Yes, this is actually correct. We know it very well in preserve. Uh, and then also ex excessive cost of the innovative material. This is somehow linked to the technical barriers as well. Thank you everyone for participating in this little survey. We can then pass to our um, next speaker, Max Sturm from the Alstad Sigmaringen University. He is, as well as Christina, um, acting as technical, co technical coordinator of uh, Preserve. Um, Max is a researcher at the Sustainable Packaging Institute from the Alstad Sigmaringen University. He's actively engaged in various uh, different number of European projects, including, of course, uh, Preserve. Um, 
his, uh, his expertise is primarily focused on the development of bio-based food packaging and conducting studies of the impact of the e-beam treatments on the properties of the bio-based polymers, films, and coatings. Max, the floor is yours. I'm sharing my screen. Um, should be visible to you now. Um, yeah, so uh, today I will be presenting some results of the whey protein-based oxygen barrier coatings we've applied in the preserve project at a lab and a pilot scale, um, as well as some modifications we performed on the uh, whey protein coating. Um, before I get into the topic, I just want to give a short introduction of the Sustainable Packaging Institute. We're located in the southwest of Germany. Here you can see it on the map. It's uh, between Stuttgart and the Lake of Constance. If you ever decide to visit us here in Siegmaringen, I can really recommend to visit also the Castle Hohenzollern in the city center of Siegmaringen. And of course, uh, the research factory where we're located, as well as a startup center and an academy. Um, the Sustainable Packaging Institute, SPI for short, is involved in six thematic areas of teaching and research um, with a main focus in the research on sustainable packaging concepts. <clears throat> Based on this, our mission is to support all players in the packaging industry along the entire value chain in the life cycle, uh, life science industry, on their way to a more sustainable circular bioeconomy competently and holistically. As I briefly mentioned before, our research is uh, divided in six thematic areas. Um, start with uh, biogenic raw materials. This is, for example, concerned with extraction of insect chitin or recovery of residual proteins. After these materials have been obtained, they of course have to be processed. So the next um, area is process technology and process design. And very important for packaging is also functional materials. So for example, residue-based functional barrier coatings as we're doing in the preserve project uh, with uh, the whey protein-based oxygen barrier coatings. The fourth area consists of smart packaging, so active and intelligent packaging. This is, for example, concerned with uh, time temperature indicators, oxygen scavengers, but also antimicrobial packaging. And after all this packaging has been developed, it also has to be tested. So in the fifth area, the preservation and packaging, um, storage trials and packaging tests are conducted, um, including microbiological and sensory testing. And to round everything off, the sixth area, bioeconomy and sustainability, uh, prepares life cycle assessments and uh, trainings for uh, packaging experts, for example. You can see a short overview of different projects that are currently ongoing in the Institute funded at the European, national, but also international level. Um, before I get more into detail on the results of the whey protein coating, I would first want to give a short um, background information on packaging. Um, packaging has uh, four main functions. First, uh, there's uh, the containment, for example. Um, the packaging needs to contain the packaged goods to make it easier to handle, for example, in transportation. Then there's the convenience factor for the consumer or end user, for example, it needs to be easy to open, maybe even possible to close to increase the shelf life of the product after it's being opened uh, once. Then, of course, there's the communication factor, so the packaging contains information about the product it contains. But uh, the fourth factor, protection, is what we are mostly focusing on. So the packaged goods needs to be protected from its surroundings or environment, for example, microorganism, uh, water vapor in case of dry goods, for example, but also oxygen. 
this is uh, especially important for example for nuts and oils to prevent it from uh, becoming rancid um, as you heard before in the preserve project we are focusing on the use of multi-layer structures for packaging application this has a benefit of enabling us to use less material overall compared to using uh, mono uh, material um, this is due to the fact that it uh, this allows us to combine the properties of multiple um, materials for example the water vapor barrier properties of pha and uh, oxygen barrier of whey protein so i want to illustrate this with this graph you can see on the slide is the um, packaging uh, weight against the unfavorable environmental impact so you can see with increasing packaging weight the environment environmental impact is also increasing due to uh, more material being used so this entire curve can be lowered by the use of uh, multi-layer structures but you can also see that uh, with the use of less material here on the left side the negative environmental impact um, can increase this is due to a shorter shelf life of the package good so in general um, for foodstuffs uh, most of the energy that is spent in the production is uh, used for the foods and only a small portion is used for the packaging in itself so the use of multi-layer structures can be a great uh, benefit here also from an environmental point of view um, a few words on whey proteins as well these are a side stream of the cheese manufacturing process you may be familiar with them for example from uh, protein drinks so they're used as food supplements but also as animal feed or fertilizers uh, currently there's a yearly production of about 50 million tons in europe um, a large portion of which is still being discarded at the moment so from our point of view this has a uh, benefit of making it a non-feed competitive source for uh, packaging materials as well and its potential to be used here has been found by multiple studies so far um, for example uh, due to its uh, high oxygen barrier properties its um, potential bio-based alternative to EVOH which is uh, currently the most prevalent uh, oxygen barrier coating that's being used um, and additionally it has also the benefit of being enzymatically removable so for example looking at this multi-layer structure of polyethylene uh, WPI is short for whey protein isolate which forms the basis for our coating solutions and uh, polyethylene terephthalate. Um, this can be separated by an uh, enzymatic bath in the recycling process. So the two polymer films can be recovered separate, separately and um, can be used again in a second life application. So in the preserve project, we first started um, with the application of the whey protein based coatings at a lab scale so uh, it was applied to a four size sheets with uh, this coating coating unit you can see here um, the process works like this um, the coating solution is spread here in front of this wired rod it's also illustrated here and then spread on the substrate evenly and uh, remaining water removed by heat um, resulting film you can see here on the bottom this is um, a whey protein coated pla film and as you can see it's still very transparent after it's been coated which is also uh, quite important for many packaging applications after successful implementation on lab scale the coating process once uh, upscale to pilot level at the fraunhofer ivv um here the application process is um, 
a little different than at the lab scale. Here, the coating is applied using a reverse graver printing process. This has a benefit compared to the lab scale coating of uh, uh, forming a more homogeneous coating. Don't worry, I don't want to um, explain this in too much detail. Uh, just to give some background on the results you can see in the following slides. Um, so as the whey protein based coatings are mainly used for uh, oxygen barrier, this is the first property we analyzed here, for example, for PLA substrates. Um, please keep in mind, this is on a logarithmic scale. Um, you can see here for the PLA film itself, the oxygen transmission rate was measured at approximately 600 cubic centimeters per square meter day and bar. And after application of a whey protein coating with just seven micrometer thickness, this was reduced to about 30 here at lab scale and could even be reduced to approximately 10 with uh, a second coating layer, so for overall 50 micrometer coating thickness. After this, the coating was um, upscale to pilot scale coating. In the results you can see here, um, there's uh, even better results than on uh, the lab scale with uh, two micrometer thinner coating even. So comparing this to this, um, this is due to the uh, more homogeneous coating and due to the different coating processes, as I mentioned before. Next up, we also analyzed the water vapor transmission rates of the coated PLA films. Here you can see an increasing trend with increasing coating thickness. This is due to the hydrophilic nature of the whey protein itself. So this allows for uh, higher permeability against water vapor. Next, we also applied um, the whey protein coating on PET substrates, as this is also a very important substrate um, for food pa packaging applications. Uh, here you can see also um, decrease of the oxygen transmission rate to yeah, about uh, 23. Um, down from uh, 58 of the uncoated film and even a further reduction with uh, thicker whey protein coating to approximately 10 cubic centimeters per square meter day and bar. And similar to the PLA here, we also found um, comparatively better results at the pilot scale due to the um, more homogeneous coating application due to the different coating processes. Here are the water vapor transmission rates we measured for the whey protein coated PET films. Here there's no significant difference uh, depending on the coating thickness. This is due to the um, higher oxygen, uh, sorry, water vapor barrier of the PET itself. So the whey protein itself, uh, the whey protein coating has a very small impact of the on the overall water vapor barrier properties of this uh, multilayer. Finally, we also applied the whey protein coating on PET, uh, sorry, on PE films uh, to cover most of the uh, uh, packaging films that are that are being used. Um, here we start uh, with the PE film at uh, approximately 7,000 cubic centimeters per square meter day and bar. And this was reduced to about 20 to 30 cubic centimeters per square meter day and bar for the coatings at lab scale and pilot scale. Um, as you can see, these are quite similar results to what we saw for the other substrates. And similar to the PET films here, for PE, the water vapor barrier wasn't meaningfully impacted by the whey protein coating as well. So overall, we achieved uh, very good results with these coatings. 
And to further, but to further improve on this, uh, we also applied uh, electron beam irradiation to them. Uh, this has to go to uh, induce a cross-linking reaction in the between the protein molecules to form a denser polymer network, as it's illustrated here, and thus to uh, improve or increase uh, the barrier properties against gases and water vapor. So we applied uh, electron irradiation at different doses, so at um, different amounts of energy that are delivered by the electron beam to the substrate. Uh, as you can see here, um, at lower doses here, for example, 10 kilograys, there's no significant impact. But at 20 kilograys, there was about a 30% decrease of the oxygen transmission rate. But it was then also increasing again at higher doses. So this is probably due to the um, cross-linking reaction occurring here at the higher doses, forming denser mole molecular networks. But uh, to be sure about the cause for this, uh, we still have to do some uh, more investigations. Next up, we also analyzed the water vapor transmission rates of the e-beam treated uh, films. Here you can see the results. Um, as we saw before, uh, for the PET and PE, there was no uh, meaningful impact or significant impact. Um, as the whey protein coating itself uh, uh, contributes very little to the overall water vapor barrier properties of this multilayer structure. So, um, as you said, <clears throat> so we achieved very good results also with the e beam treatment, but um, the whey protein coated films are still not um, applicable for high barrier applications. At uh, industrial scale, it's also common to use a metallization process for this. And um, so uh, this was also um, researched in the preserve project by the Fraunhofer IVB. Um, here, the metallization layer was applied on top of the whey protein coating with the substrate film below. This has also the benefit of allowing the enzymatic removal of the whey protein. So the metal layer can be separated from the uh, plastic layer here in this case, for example, PLA. So the PLA can be reprocessed uh, at end of life. The first trials here showed very promising results. You can see a um, whey protein coated and metallized PET film. There were no um, visible defects in the metal layer. And um, this was uh, also underlined by the results we found uh, for the oxygen transmission rate measurements. You can see um, for reference, uh, the whey protein coated um, PLA produced on a pilot scale we saw before uh, with an OTR of about 23. And this was reduced to approximately 0 0.17 after the metallization was applied to this. So this is um, much better results than we found for some commercial PL, uh, metallized PLA films. So you can see here for a uh, reference. Uh, similarly, for uh, PET, the OTR was reduced also below 0 0.2 cubic centimeters per square meter day and bar after the metallization. So similar results for uh, both substrates. Um, also looking at the water vapor transmission rates, um, here there was a reduction due to the metallization application on the films. Here you can see also for reference um, the metal uh, the whey protein coated PLA from the pilot scale, which has then been metallized with a reduction 
from um, about 50 to 20 grams per square meter in day. And also for um, PET, also uh, about a 2.3 fold uh, reduction from five to about two grams per square meter. Uh, and they for the water vapor transmission rate. So to conclude, um, for the oxygen transmission rate, we found a high decrease uh, due to the whey protein coating for PLA, PE, and PET substrates. Uh, in some cases, uh, the water vapor transmission rate was uh, increased, but for PE and PET, this property was not impacted by the coating. Um, with the electron beam irradiation, we were able to further reduce the OTR of the whey protein coated uh, PET. And uh, with uh, metallization, the OTR and water vapor transmission rate were further decreased, also enabling high barrier applications concerning the um, oxygen transmission rate with these uh, films. So with this, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Here's also some contact information in case you have uh, further questions uh, on this um, presentation. Thank you, Max. Thank you. That was a very detailed pre presentation. I hope um, people enjoyed it. Uh, I have a quick question for you on this. How could enzymatic delamination of, of the whey protein coatings be implemented, to your opinion? Uh, so I think um, here, um, just get this out of the way. <laughs> um, so in current um, recycling processes, the uh, plastic films go through a, a cleaning bath, basically. So here, um, the enzyme that um, yeah that, that removes the uh, protein could be added, and this. Um, the, the material separated. Of course, the material has to be shredded or perforated before to increase the area where the enzyme can, say, um, attack the, the protein. And uh, so the materials can be separ um, yeah, separated from one another and then in further steps um, put into different uh, recycling streams. Okay, we have we have uh, another one, a very quick one um, from Alexandra Miletic here in the chat. Did you check the addition of protein layer on different substrates? Uh, yes, the we measured the uh, bond strength. Um, yeah, um, what I didn't mention here, of course, uh, for the PE, there's uh, some pre-treatment necessary to enable the. Um, proper adhesion of the whey protein so, uh, based solution on the films. And um, yeah, the, the values we found were in a, a good range so far. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers by heart. A few of them, yeah. <laughs> OK. Thank you very much, Max. Uh, for the people in the audience, please remember you can post your questions or comments in the chat. And I will introduce our final speaker of today. She's uh, Maria Monedero from ITENE. Uh, she has a degree in the chemical science and she holds a PhD in food technology. Uh, she has been part of ITENE since 2010 in the field of research and development for new packaging materials. And she's focused on food and cosmetic applications. Also, she works in the area of consultancy in the field of the material safety for the compliance assessment with the current legislation. Maria, whenever you want. Thank you, Aldo. I'm gonna share. I'm gonna share the presentation. Um, okay. I think you are looking at it. Okay. I'm gonna start. Uh, I'm going to talk about the legislation applicable to food content materials, and for that, I have uh, structured my presentation in two main topics. 
um, by the one hand, the general requirements applicable to the food contact materials. And then I, I will explain the specific measures for plastics and also for coatings. And I will finish with uh, some conclusions. Uh, I always um, like to, to start with this, uh, with this uh, slide, okay? Um, because uh, we tend usually to think, uh, when we think in food content materials, we used to think of uh, packaging, but uh, um, food content materials are more than packaging. Uh, they can be also kitchenware, for example, work surfaces and the industry at our homes, uh, at a restaurant, working lines in the industry, etc. In fact, um, uh, food content materials are materials which may reasonably be expected to come into direct or indirect contact with foodstuffs. And so that uh, food content materials legislation uh, aims to protect health and uh, the interest of consumers. Um, it established uh, some suitability criteria so that the products, the food content materials are safe. Uh, here you can see uh, an overview of the regulatory map in Europe. Uh, all food content materials have to comply with two uh, uh, let's say cross-cutting uh, regulations, which are the framework regulation of materials and articles intended to come into contact with food, and also with the good manufacturing practice uh, regulation, GMP. Uh, apart from that, depending on the type of food contact material, uh, we have to comply with uh, some specific uh, measures applicable uh, uh, depending on the type of, uh, of material. Uh, at today, just uh, a few uh, types of food contact materials are covered by this, uh, these specific measures. Uh, they are the regenerative cellulose, ceramics, active and intelligent materials and articles, um, uh, articles of polyamide and melamine uh, from China and Hong Kong, and plastics and recycled plastics. Apart from that, uh, we can uh, find also some specific measures for certain uh, substances, uh, such as bisphenol A, for example, or n nitrosamines but uh, there are a large number of food content materials that nowadays uh, are not covered by any specific uh, measure, such as uh, coatings, for example, printing inks, adhesives, glass, uh, paper and board, etc. Uh, framework regulation uh, shall apply to materials which in their finished state are intended to be in contact with food. Uh, for example, it can be um, uh, this um, plastic container uh, that we use to uh, to conserve uh, to to preserve our, the food that we cook at homes. For example, uh, or also for um, materials that are already in contact with food, uh, which means uh, any food packaging, or in, uh, even. Uh, materials that can reasonably be expected to come into contact with food or to transfer uh, their constituents to food under normal or forcible condu conditions of use. Uh, for example, a, a napkin or a tablecloth, um, they are not conceived or not designed specifically to be in contact with food, but when uh, during normal use, it's possible uh, this, this kind of contact. Um, the main objective of this uh, framework regulation is to ensure uh, an effectiveness functioning of the internal uh, market of the food content materials in the European Union, and also a high level of protection of the human health and the interest of consumers. And for that, uh, it uh, is based in mainly uh, for main pillars, which are food safety, labeling, traceability, and um, uh, the requirement of a declaration uh, of compliance. Materials and articles uh, should be manufactured uh, in compliance with good manufacturing practice so that under normal or forcible conditions of use, they do not transfer their constituents to food in quantities which could endanger 
human health or uh, causing uh, unacceptable changes in the food, uh, in their composition or in the organoleptic um, or sensory characteristics of the food. Uh, it is called the food safety principle and is laid down in Article 3 of the uh, framework regulation. Apart from that, and also in line with this uh, protection of the interests of the consumers, labeling, advertising, and presentation of a material shall not mislead consumers. Regarding the good manufacturing practice, uh, the objective is to ensure that materials and articles are produced and controlled so that they are uh, uh, in conformity with the rules uh, which apply to them and also with uh, high quality standards uh, by not endangering human health or causing unacceptable changes in the composition of the food or their uh, organoleptic characteristics, which means that the main objective of this good manufacturing practice regulation is that uh, the food conduct materials are uh, compliant with Article 3 of the framework uh, regulation. This good manufacturing practice shall apply to all sectors at all stages of manufacture, uh, but excluding the production of the starting substances. Um, it has uh, three main uh, requirements related to the implementation of a quality assurance system, the implementation of a quality control system, and also the maintenance of the uh, associated documentation to these, uh, to these systems. Um, there are also uh, specific requirements for uh, the processing of printing inks and uh, recycled plastics. And uh, this uh, regulation is very short and um, does not um, uh, state uh, specifically how to do, how to implement this quality assurance system or this quality control system, but uh, we have uh, sectorial industrial guidelines and standards uh, that uh, can give us support to the implementation uh, of this uh, good manufacturing practice. And now uh, I am going to explain the measures for plastics, this, this specific measures that we have for, for plastics. Uh, plastics have to comply with uh, regulation 10, 2011. Uh, this regulation applies to all kinds of plastics, uh, plastics um, in multi-layers, plastics uh, printed and or covered by a coating, plastic layers of, or plastic coatings, and also plastic layers in multi-layer, multi-material articles, and also applies to bioplastics uh, based on synthetic polymers, natural polymers that uh, have been chemically uh, modified, and also uh, polymers manufactured by microbial fermentation, but not applied to uh, natural polymers that not have been uh, chemically uh, modified. Um, plastics uh, have to comply with, as, as I said before, with uh, uh, Regulation 10 2011. But uh, this regulation states that the plastics have also to comply with the horizontal regulations, uh, which means that uh, plastics have to comply with Article 3 of the framework regulation, also the requirements of labeling and traceability, and also the uh, manufacturing uh, practice, uh, the good manufacturing practice uh, regulation. Apart from that, uh, obviously plastics have to comply with the requirements on the plastic regulation itself, uh, which mainly are uh, related to compositional requirements, the verification of the composition, the verification on the restrictions and specifications applicable, uh, depending on the composition of the plastic material. And also we have uh, requirements uh, related to the uh, declaration of compliance and supporting documents. And now I am going to briefly, quickly uh, explain uh, this uh, main uh, um, this main requirements laid down on uh, plastics uh, regulation. The first one is related to the composition. Uh, as a general rule, uh, to manufacture plastic uh, materials for food conduct, we can uh, we. Uh, only can use the substances listed in the union list in Annex 1 of the plastics regulation. This list uh, consists of monomers or other starting substances, additives, polymer production nets, 
macromolecules obtained from microbial fermentation and substances in nanoform. And we can also find uh, some restrictions and specifications from columns to, uh, from 7 to 11 of, the, of, this, uh, of this list. And regarding uh, restrictions and specifications, uh, we are going to find uh, an overall migration limit states in uh, 10 milligrams per square decimeter or 60 milligrams per kilo when the food, uh, when the food content material um, is for food for infants and young children. Uh, this is the maximum permitted amount of non-volatile substances uh, that can be released from a material uh, into food simulants. And it's a kind of measure of the innerness of, uh, of the material. Uh, regarding the specific migration limit, which is another restriction that we can find for, for certain substances, it is expressed as uh, milligrams of substance per kilo of uh, food simulant or food uh, or food stuff. Uh, and it's the maximum uh, permitted amount of a given substance or the sum of a, um, a group of substances that can be released from a material into a food or food simulant. Other restrictions that uh, we can find are the residual, uh, a maximum residual content of certain substances, which is the maximum permitted amount of a given substance in a material. And also in Annex 2, uh, we find uh, restrictions uh, related to the release of certain substances, and mainly they are mainly metals, such as uh, aluminum or cobalt, uh, copper, iron, etc., and the migration of uh, primary aromatic amines. And uh, the verification of uh, these uh, restrictions usually take place by means of a migration test. And a migration test basically uh, consists of the reproduction of, con uh, of conditions, time, temperature, uh, contact type, uh, to which the material or the article will be exposed uh, when in contact with the food uh, product um, during uh, the normal or forcible conditions of use. And it's uh, an accelerated test. Uh, to carry out this set, we have to put into contact the food simulant, which is a test medium that uh, imitates the behavior of the food product. We have to put into contact this food simulant with the material or article. Uh, for that, we have uh, to select first the test medium according to the annexes of the plastics regulation. Then we have also to, uh, to select the contact method, depending on the geometry and on the actual use of the, of the material. Uh, we have several options. For example, we can uh, use a total immersion for any kind of geometry. Uh, in this uh, total immersion method, uh, the, the article is, um, the article is uh, absolutely completely immersed into the food simulant and the total uh, surface of the, uh, of the article is in contact with the food simulant. Uh, but if uh, we have films or sheets, we can use uh, the cell method or the pouch method. In the pouch, we um, uh, prepare or manufacture a pouch with a film and filling with the, with the food simulant. And in both methods, uh, just the contact, the food contact side of the, of the material is in contact with the food simulant. And finally, uh, for articles that can be filled, uh, we will use this, uh, this kind of contact method, uh, for example, for a bottle. And apart from that, we have to select also the, the test conditions. As I said before, it's an accelerated test. And uh, these test conditions um, are selected according to the, to the annexes of the, of the plastics regulation and are also um, um, uh, selected according to the actual use, uh, conditions of use of the material in contact with the food. Uh, once uh, this uh, exposition period in contact with uh, the material with a food simulant is finished, we recover the we reco recover the the food simulant and then we analyze uh, this restriction. Okay, for example, we can verify the overall migration limit. 
uh, we can also verify uh, the specific migration limit or of, uh, certain substances that can be present um, because of the formulation of the composition of the plastic itself. And we can also analyze the NIAS. Uh, NIAS are the non-intentionally uh, added substances, but uh, they are substances that can be present into the material um, because they can, um, with uh, impurities with the starting substances, they come from the degradation or reaction during the manufacturing of the plastic or even um, from contamination. And uh, then the, um, the final um, requirement, big requirement um, uh, of, the, uh, of the plastic regulation is a declaration of compliance. Uh, this document is a written document uh, which is issued by the, by the business operator at the marketing stages, except at the retail. And the information has to be according to the Annex 4 of the plastic regulation. Um, if you can see at the, the, the screen, um, the main information that is required is related to, for example, um, to um, administrative data of the business uh, operator, uh, also with, uh, is related to the identity of the materials, uh, we have to provide with a description also. We have to confirm uh, that the material uh, meets, the, meets the requirements uh, applicable to them uh, by legislation. We have to give inf uh, adequate information uh, on the substances that can be present and uh, with restrictions in Annexes 1 or 2 uh, of the plastics uh, regulation. We have also to give information about the uh, type or types of food and conditions um, applicable to this uh, to this material. And we have also to give information if there is uh, some uh, dual use substance. A dual use substance is uh, an additive that can be used either for uh, for food. It's a food additive or aroma or flavor. And also it's an additive that we can use um, uh, in the formulation of a plastic uh, material. And also this uh, declaration of compliance uh, shall be renewed if uh, there is new scientific data uh, available and significant for this uh, information or uh, changes in the legislation that affect the, the information given in this, in this declaration of compliance. And apart from that, uh, we have to maintain supporting documents, which are documents to demonstrate uh, that the information that we are providing in this uh, declaration of compliance is true and we have uh, verified the restrictions applicable to the, to the material. Uh, this has to be available to the national uh, competent uh, authority on request and uh, can be, for example, um, uh, the test reports, for example, or uh, calculations, uh, analysis, evidence evidence uh, on the de on demonstrating compliance. And now I, I am going to talk uh, about to explain the specific measures for coatings. Uh, as I said before, uh, coatings are not covered by any uh, harmonized uh, measures in Europe. Uh, but, uh, however, we have to comply with Article 3 of the Framework Regulation, this uh, safety principle. And uh, for that, we can use, for example, um, uh, national legislations uh, available in other uh, member states, for example, uh, guidelines, scientific opinions, um, etc. Uh, in this slide, you can see some of the options that uh, that uh, the most uh, relevant options that uh, we can use to 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 comply with uh, this principle, uh, this safety principle. But uh, there are more others. And apart from that, if the um, if the coatings are formulated with uh, some epoxy derivatives, we have also to comply with Commission Regulation 1895 on the restriction of use of certain epoxy derivatives. Uh, in fact, uh, this regulation uh, applies to materials and articles made of any type of plastic. Uh, those covered by coating products and, and adhesives shall not apply to containers or storage tanks uh, with a capacity exceeding 10,000 liters. Basically, prohibits the use of two compounds, 
in the food conduct materials and allows the use of body and its derivatives, but with certain migration limits. Also, it requires a declaration of compliance for the products uh, containing these uh, epoxy uh, derivatives. Now, uh, I am going to explain some of the, of the provision listed in the, in the first slide. Uh, the first one is the Real Decreto 847 in Spain. It's a national legislation in Spain. It's related to polymeric materials and uh, it includes uh, varnishes uh, and coatings among these uh, polymeric materials. It establishes a positive list of substances for the manufacture of these uh, of these materials, but also uh, it allows to use the substances listed in the Annex One of the Plastics Regulation and substances approved by other member states for food conduct materials. It uh, establishes uh, identity and purity requirements for the dyes used in, in the polymeric materials in, in uh, Annex 2 and sets an overall migration limit of 10 milligrams per square decimeter or 60 milligrams uh, per kilo for, for materials for, for foods for, for young children and infa infants. And also, it sets specific migration limits for, uh, and when uh, there is a substance uh, without this uh, specific uh, limit uh, assigned, a generic limit of 60 milligrams per kilo uh, applies. Uh, apart from that, uh, to carry out the test, the migration test, uh, we have to select these conditions according to the plastic regulation. And uh, this uh, Real Decreto also regulates the use of dual uh, use uh, additives. Uh, another legislation that we can use to, to verify compliance for coatings is the Dutch Packaging and Consumer uh, Articles Regulation. Uh, in particular, Chapter 10 is dedicated to coatings. Uh, it establishes uh, some composition uh, requirements to manufacture these, these uh, coatings and um, uh, allows uh, uh, the use of uh, some monomers and additives according to the type of formulation. Apart from that, we can find uh, some manufacturing requirements, such as, uh, for example, base and auxiliary, auxiliary materials uh, have uh, to be of high um, technical quality and uh, must be used in quantities uh, strictly necessary. Uh, dyes, pigments, and inks, inks uh, have to be employed uh, according to Chapter 9 of this uh, packaging and consumers articles regulation and solvents must comply with the safety principle uh, state on uh, on article 3 of the framework uh, regulation uh, there are also some requirements for the final article an overall migration limit of uh, 60 milligrams per uh, kilo and uh, it states also the specific migration of certain uh, listed uh, substances of course if uh, we use these substances in the formulation of the, of the protein. Uh, Belgium has also uh, uh, a national legislation uh, related to, to coatings. Um, these coatings um, included in the scope can be used for different uh, applications, for example, for metallic materials, for flexible, which means for plastics, or high capacity agri-food uh, applications for food contact. Um, the main requirements of this uh, of this arete royal uh, is uh, related are related to composition. Uh, in fact, for the manufacturing of these uh, coatings, we can use uh, the substances listed in Annex One of the Plastics Regulation. The, you remember the positive list. We can use also the approved uh, substances by other member states for food contact uh, materials, substances with a positive uh, opinion from EFSA or an equivalent body. EFSA is the European Food Safety Authority um, in charge of the risk assessment of the substances. And uh, we can also use other substances, but if all the following conditions are met, they have to comply with Article 3 of the Framework Regulation. Uh, their migration has to be uh, undetectable, uh, which means uh, it is below uh, 10 ppbs. And also they are not classified as carcinogenic, and mutagenic, toxic for reproduction, nanoform, or genotoxic. 
split uh, regarding migration. Uh, it sets out an overall migration limit uh, of 10 milligrams per square decimeter. Uh, they set out also uh, some certain specific migration limits for certain substances. And when, when there is a substance uh, with no limits, applies uh, the general uh, limit of 60, uh, 60 milligrams per, per kilo. It also regulates the use of dual use additives. Uh, uh, another requirement is relating to uh, varnishes or coatings applied on metals. They shall not be subject to the release limits set by the core re uh, resolution on metals and alloys. And the actual uh, surface to volume ratio shall be used except in specific cases where legislation determines that the generic ratio of six square decimeter per kilo of food should be used. Um, regarding the migration test, uh, the test conditions to be selected are uh, set out in the annex and are very, very similar to those of the plastics uh, regulation. And uh, this uh, national legislation also requires to uh, the materials be accompanied by a declaration uh, of compliance. Uh, finally, uh, apart from these national legislations, we can also use, uh, for example, BFR recommendations. Uh, BFR recommendations are uh, not legally binding, but they are uh, highly respected and recognized by the industry and by governments. And they are produced by the uh, uh, German Institute for the Risk Assessment, uh, which is a similar body equivalent to EFSA, but uh, in Germany. Uh, we have uh, two BFR recommendations that we can use for coatings. Uh, we have BFR recommendation 14 on polymer dispersions. It applies to coatings for applications uh, where temperatures do not exceed uh, 90 degrees Celsius. Uh, it establishes a list, a positive list of substances uh, that can be used for the manufacturing of these coatings in the, in the formulation of the coatings. And also we can use the substances listed in the plastics uh, regulation. Apart from that, we are going to find some restrictions on uh, maximum uh, residual content of certain substances, on the use maximum uh, amount of certain substances to be used in the formulation, or uh, specific migration limits. Apart from that, we can also uh, have, uh, if it applies, the BFR recommendation 25 on hard paraffins, microcrystalline waxes, and mixture of these waxes, resins, uh, and plastics. It's mainly uh, says requirements regarding the composition uh, for the paraffin to be suitable for food contact. And there's uh, another requirement, a particular requirement that says that uh, these um, paraffins must not be used with fats and oil or with fatty foodstuffs in which fat forms the external phase. And uh, just to conclude, uh, food contact materials must comply with the cross uh, carrying regulations that I I've uh, explained uh, at the beginning of my presentation. They are, they are the framework regulation, and in particular, it's uh, very important the safety principles set out in Article 3. Uh, they have also to comply with the good manufacturing practice regulation. And apart from this, if we have plastics, they have to comply with the regulation 10-2011, um, the, where the main requirements are related to the composition, to the verification of restrictions, and the declaration of compliance. And if we have coatings, um, Coatings uh, are not covered by any specific uh, harmonized measure at European level. However, uh, we have to demonstrate compliance with this uh, safety principle in Article 3 of the Framework Regulation. Uh, and I have uh, explained, um, show uh, a list, uh, just uh, a proposal of um, national legislations that, can, that we can use to demonstrate this, uh, this compliance. Uh, apart from that, if we are using uh, any epoxy derivative, uh, we have also to comply with Commission Regulation 1895. And uh, that's all by my side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you for a uh, for very detailed presentation as well.
we have uh, some questions that we will um, collect and we will come back to to you via email. Also, to everyone, please remember for any more consultations or comments, you have our website. In there, you will have all kind of contacts to all the people who has been speaking here today. Thank you very much all for joining today for uh, <coughs> sorry for your time and i hope you can enjoy uh, a bit more of the project in the website you can join also the crowdelix uh, platform and thanks again for your for your time have a good day <laughs>